Welcome to Tales of Bedlam. I'm your host, Micah, and with me today, my lovely wife, who will be taking over for Dustin this uh, season two of Tales of Bedlam. Hi. (laughs) I'm Andrea. Today's story, uh, if you listened to the previous episode on a history of Sleeping Beauty, is our first story for the... A five. A five-minute history of Sleeping Beauty... This is the first story of the three that we were going to do from the history or different versions of Sleeping Beauty through the last six centuries. Our tale today comes from 1636 in Italy by the author Gian Battista Basile, and it's called Sun, Moon, and Talia. We do have to give a trigger warning here because some of these stories involve unconsexual sex and cannibalism. Did I say... (laughs) <laughs> I'm sorry. Involved yeah. non-consensual sex and cannibalism. Let me correct that. <laughs> what did I say? I don't even know. <laughs> Unconsensual sex? <laughs> We've flung far afield here. Okay. So, All right. So, anyway. Andrea, who hasn't spoken much yet, gets to start us off with... Sun, Moon, and Talia. There once lived a great lord who was blessed with the birth of a daughter whom he named Talia. Eager to learn of her destiny, he summoned the wisest men and astrologers in his realm. After much deliberation and the casting of her horoscope, they determined that Talia would one day face grave peril from a splinter of flax. To protect her, the Lord decreed that no flax, hemp, or similar materials would be allowed in his household, hoping to shield her from his foretold danger. (laughs) Very similar to the Sleeping Beauty that we know today with the spindle. That's right. With the flax. Yeah. Same but different. Right. One day, as Talia had blossomed into a young and beautiful woman, She was gazing out of a window when she noticed an old woman passing by, spinning thread. That's talent. What, what, spinning and walking? Yeah. It's kind of like rubbing your belly and patting your head. Exactly. Having never seen a spindle before, Talia was intrigued by the spinning spindle and driven by curiosity called the old woman over. Mm. Hello, can I touch your sharp thing? Me, uh uh-uh. Eager to understand this new object, Talia took the spindle and began to stretch the flax. Tragically, a splinter of flax lodged itself under her nail. Ouch. Causing her to collapse lifeless to the ground. It's like the splinters under the nails when you, in mm. the movies. Isn't like, that painful? Ugh. Yeah, the torture. Yeah, they yeah. kidnap some spy who's the good guy trying to save the world and they try to put slivers of wood underneath their fingernails. I I can't ever watch that. So the old woman, terrified by what had happened, fled in panic and hasn't stopped running since. Hmm. (laughs) She may still be running. Like, forced. That's right. Maybe they'll meet up. It would be pretty scary. Thinking a woman just died. You know, from something you gave her. Yeah, but I wouldn't just run in any particular direction forever because of it. Yeah, that would be a a stretch and run. (laughs) You stretch (laughs) before you run? No, hold on. I'm I'm in full panic here, but give me a second to stretch. (laughs) No, you know, instead of a hit and run, she stretched the flag, so it was like a stretch (laughs) and <laughs> Sorry, dumb humor. <laughs> She's okay. stretching the flax. Yes, it was a stretch and run. And so she ran because the woman died. <laughs> oh All my right. god! Go ahead. It's a stretch by. Yeah, I gotcha. When the grief-stricken father learned of the tragic event, his heart broke, and he wept enough tears to fill a cask. After paying this sorrowful price, he had Talia's lifeless body taken to one of his country estates, where she was placed on a velvet throne beneath a canopy 
So that's different. Not on a bed. Mm -hmm. Overcome with grief and desperate to escape the memory of his immense loss, he locked the doors and abandoned the mansion, never to return to the palace that had brought him such unbearable sorrow. Sometime later, it so happened that a king was out hunting and passed by the estate. One of his falcons slipped from his grasp and flew through an open window into the house. When the bird didn't return his call, the king sent a servant to knock at the door, assuming the palace was inhabited. So despite knocking for a considerable time, no one answered. Determined to retrieve his falcon, the king ordered a ladder and climbed up to explore the house. So one of his entourage just happened to have a ladder? Well, you know, he ordered it, so... <laughs> I guess he could have had it made. <laughs> Go get even. it, or... Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or maybe they made themselves into a ladder, like a human ladder? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's... It's possible. <laughs> yeah. He searched every room, nook, and corner, astonished to find no signs of life. Finally, he reached the reception hall, where Tully appeared enchanted. Mistaking her unconscious state for sleep, the king called out to her, but she did not wake. Captivated by her beauty, his desire overwhelmed him, and he lifted her in his arms, carrying her to a bed where he took advantage of her. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. That's This is wrong. where it gets bad. Afterward, he left her on the bed and returned to his kingdom, where the demands of his realm soon made him forget the encounter for a time. Dirtbag. Yeah. Well, after nine months, Talia gave birth to two beautiful children, a boy and a girl, each as precious as rare jewels. Two fairies who visited the palace cared for them and placed the infants at their mother's breast. On one occasion, however, the babies couldn't find the nipple and began to suck on Talia's fingers instead. Mm -hmm. They sucked so persistently that the splinter of flax was dislodged. Talia awoke as if from a deep slumber, and upon seeing the two priceless gems beside her, she embraced them, offering them her breast. Well, there's a lot of anatomy in that paragraph. Wow. Uh -huh. well, yeah, but that's pretty, well done. that's pretty good. It just took getting that out of her finger, and she awoke. So Too bad somebody hadn't thought of that sooner. I know. Where did these fairies come from? I don't know. It doesn't say. I know. Uh, they just appeared. I mean, two fairies visited the palace, cared for her. What, 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 what? Go ahead. Oh. The children became dearer to her than life itself, alone in the palace with her two children. Talia was bewildered, unsure of what had transpired. Uh, yeah, that would be pretty scary. Wake up. Mm -hmm. Who knows how long later and have two children? Yet she noticed that the table was always set, with food and drink brought to her, though she saw no attendance. Which has to be the fairies still, right? Mm -hmm. I'd assume. Meanwhile, the king began to think of Talia again. Pretending he was going hunting, he returned to the palace and found her awake with two beautiful children by her side. Uh-oh. Overjoyed, he revealed to Talia who he was, recounting how he had discovered her and all that had transpired. Upon hearing this, their bond grew even more robust, and the king stayed with her for several days. Before leaving, he promised to return but soon. We're not going to talk about that? No, you did a good job. <laughs> <laughs> what? I did a good job? No, I mean... <sighs> she just is going to accept that? I mean... Okay. I, I guess... I don't know. What I guess you she say? needed a baby daddy and, uh, hey, hey, he's a, he's a king. There's some security there. Mm -hmm. But never mind what he did. I know. <laughs> That's... I okay. felt like we had talked That's about this, up. but yeah, I guess, you know, she is alone. She has two kids. And back then, do anything for your king and. Or your kids. 
not back then. I mean, it was more to be, like, kings ruled. They, you know, whatever they told you, that went. And, <laughs> well, I don't know. Not that it's right. I, I'm just I, saying. I don't think she was so much thinking about what he thought. I think she was maybe just thinking of how she was going to take care of those kids. Yeah, exactly. It it would be frightening. Yeah. And at least she doesn't remember that happening. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. Shoot. Okay. So before leaving, he promised to return soon and return her and the children to his kingdom. However, once he returned to his realm, he found no peace, constantly uttering the names of Talia and the children, whom he called Sun and Moon. Even in his sleep, he found himself calling out to them. The king's wife grew suspicious. This dirtbag just gets worse. Anyway, she grew suspicious due to the increasing length of his hunting trips and how he constantly spoke of Talia, Sun, and Moon. Consumed by a fiery jealousy, he summoned the royal secretary and said, Listen closely, my son. You are caught between a rock and a hard place, between danger and destruction. If you tell me who my husband, the king, is in love with, I will reward you with untold riches. But if you withhold the truth, you will vanish without a trace, dead or alive. Terrified, the man felt his fear and greed overpowered any sense of honor or justice. He confessed everything to the queen, speaking plainly and leaving nothing out. I don't think he's losing really any honor in telling the queen what her evil husband's been doing behind her back. So, upon learning the truth, the queen sent the secretary to Talia, pretending to speak on behalf of the king, and requested that she send the children, as the king wished to see them. Overjoyed, Talia complied without hesitation. However, the queen, whose heart is cruel, ordered the cook to kill the children and prepare them into a series of delicious dishes for her unsuspecting husband. The cook, moved by the sight of the innocent children, couldn't carry out the queen's wicked plan. Instead, he took the children home to his wife and hid them. He prepared two lambs in their place, transforming them into a hundred different dishes. When the king arrived, the queen took great pleasure in having the meal served to him. hundred dishes, that's a lot. And um, not only is he a great chef, he's saved the children. Yeah. So he's like the hero. He's not a bad guy. I didn't say he was. Right. I'm agreeing. <laughs> <laughs> well, the king savored the meal, exclaiming, By the soul of my ancestors, this is excellent. Each time the queen responded with, Eat! Oh, eat! (laughs) For you are eating of your own! (laughs) At first, the king paid little attention to her repeated phrase, but after hearing it several times, he finally snapped. Of course, I'm eating my own, since you've brought nothing into this house. Angered, he stood up and left, heading to a villa some distance away to calm his temper and find peace. He does need to find some peace. Well, she's screaming at him and telling him he's... What, eating his own? Is that what he said? If it were true, yeah, if it were true... It would be a terrible thing. And I'd but like, he doesn't know that. You crazy at lady? At this point. So. What the heck? <laughs> Stop yelling at me. I mean, he doesn't know that they're dead either. Right. Or anything, because he just thinks that she's being pushy today. <laughs> Meanwhile, the queen, not yet satisfied with the harm she had caused, summoned the secretary and instructed him 
to go to the palace and bring Talia back, claiming that the king awaited her presence. Believing she was obeying the Lord's wishes and eager to see him again, Talia left immediately, unaware of the danger awaiting her. She was met by the queen, whose face was burning with fierce anger. Whoa. First of all, why I didn't know that palaces had secretaries. Maybe somebody's got to, you know, make appointments. And... Well, I mean, there's a lot of people in the palace, so it makes sense. You got to keep them all in order somehow. Oh, yeah, maybe it's just like a manager. Yeah. Hmm? She greeted her with scorn. So this is the queen greeting the princess with scorn, saying, Welcome, welcome, madam, busybody. You're quite the piece of work, you wretched creature, enjoying my husband. Oh. So you are the lump of filth, the cruel bitch, who has driven me to madness. Change your ways, for you'll soon find yourself in purgatory, where I will make sure you pay for all the harm you've caused me. Wow. That's... Yep, that was quite a rant. Uh, yeah. I'd give that a... I'd give it a 7.5 out of 10. As rants go. So, <laughs> if I met a queen, would she uh -huh. come ranting at me, saying all those horrible things? I'm pretty sure I'd turn around and leave. <laughs> yeah. I, I've, uh, heard, I've heard worse in PG-13 movies today, so... Yeah, but that was a movie. If that was at me... That's true. I, I've heard worse on the streets. <laughs> at you? People are saying these to you. I guess not at that's me. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess there's been a few times it's been at me. Well, that's scary. Un undeserved, of okay, course. Okay, yeah. Well, let's see what she says. Let's see. Well, upon hearing these words, Talia tried to defend herself, explaining that she was not to blame because her husband, the king had taken her by surprise while she was in a deep sleep. However, the queen refused to listen to her pleas. She ordered a large fire to be set up in the palace courtyard and commanded that Talia be thrown into it. Uh-oh, I think the king needs to get home. Seeing the dire situation, Talia knelt before the queen and pleaded to at least be allowed to remove her garments. The queen, not driven by sympathy, but by the desire to claim the richly embroidered robes adorned with gold and pearls, agreed, saying, You may take off your clothes. As Talia removed each piece of clothing, she cried out loudly in distress. No! After removing her robe, skirt, bodice, and shift, she was about to remove her final garment when she let out a piercing scream. The guards then dragged her to the fire, where she was to be burned to ash. It's getting tense. Yeah. Pretty scary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, boy. Upon witnessing the horrifying scene, the king suddenly appeared and demanded an explanation. When he asked about his children, his wife, accusing him of betrayal, revealed that she had had them slaughtered <gasps> and served as meat. <gasps> Overwhelmed with despair, the king lamented, Alas! I have become the wolf devouring my own sweet lambs. Why did my veins not recognize the blood of my own flesh? You, dog, what evil deed is this witch you have done? Be gone! You will receive the punishment you deserve. But I won't send someone with such a cruel heart to the Coliseum for penis. <laughs> with these words, the king ordered that the queen be thrown into the fire she had prepared for Talia and the secretary, who had orchestrated this cruel scheme. He also intended to punish the cook, whom he suspected of slaughtering his children. However, the cook threw himself at the king's feet and pleaded, My lord, my lord, for such a crime nothing less than a blazing inferno and a spear from behind would be just. 
I would willingly accept being burned alive and have my ashes mixed with the queen's, but I hope for a different reward for saving the children, despite the queen's malevolence, who sought to kill them and return to you what was yours by blood. Upon hearing these words, the king was stunned and disbelieving, unable to fathom what he had just heard. Turning to the cook, he said, If it is true that you saved my children, know that I will remove you from this task and place you in a position of honor. Where you can fulfill all my desires, I will reward you generously so that... <laughs> so that you may consider yourself fortunate in this world. Ah. As the king spoke, the cook's wife, recognizing her husband's plight, brought out the two children, sun and moon, for their father to see. The king delighted in playing with his family, showering them with kisses and affection. He rewarded the cook handsomely, appointing him as a chamberlain. He married Talia and they lived a long and happy life together with their children, genuinely embodying the truth of the proverb, Those whom fortune favors find good luck even in their sleep. This was not a great story. <laughs> <laughs> you mean, well... Uh, the bad well, guy wins. Yeah, this is not a great story. This is... This is Sleeping Beauty before it became what we know today. It makes it sound like it ends happily because they lived long and happy life together. Mm -hmm. And maybe that is good. Maybe he will be better to her than he was to his yeah, previous wife. He wasn't happy at the castle with the queen. And he fell for Talia and had children that he loved. Well... When you say he fell for, he may have fell for her afterwards, but the first time it was obviously just no. That's why I mean fell like he didn't at first, but then he fell for her afterwards, mm -hmm. like when he came back. Right, because it said that he went and when he came stop back to do that of awful thing again, and then he's like, "Oh, <laughs> I have two kids." <laughs> yeah. So no, I am. He was an awful person, mm -hmm. and and nothing that he did was right. But it seems like they're going to be happy. So. Hopefully he will take good care of those children and Talia. Maybe right? it's a story about second chances. I guess you could look at that. Gosh, so then we have yeah. to go into a moral oh, uh, yeah. conundrum yeah. Yeah. about does he deserve a second chance? Because the thing that he did was pretty gross. But then, see, there goes my brain. All of these, you know, which ways? Because look how awful the queen was. Well, that was her reaction. Yes, it was a poor reaction. That's not a normal person's reaction. <laughs> there was so this, maybe this Bobbit lady. Not that it would ever be okay, but why would a husband usually like go that drastic? I mean, like you could just get all crazy thinking and be like, maybe he hated his life and his queen life. So you're saying it's life. the queen's fault? You never. Wow, I'm just saying. No, that's okay. She maybe she wasn't the best wife. But you don't. He should never do have done what he did. But no, no, he should not have. It was awful. Maybe the queen. Just... And then he was gonna do it again. That's what really gets Are me. Are you sure? Do we know that? Yeah, he's he was. I mean, did he have any idea to think that she might be awake when he comes back? He was going to poke the lifeless body, and that's. That's what gets me, that he went back a second time. Maybe he was going to just that, check on her. <laughs> that makes it hard to give the guy a I second chance. But I'm an optimistic. I okay. like to give people... <laughs> okay, okay. I just, I feel that, that, yeah. Maybe he was just going to apologize and <laughs> see if she, she's okay. I, I don't think he so. He said he explained what think, happened and be like, I'm so sorry. I do not think that's what was on his mind. Maybe but we can just think that. We could, I mean, if you think See that, the good in the world. if you think that he was like carrying a bouquet of roses and a box of chocolates with this long rehearsed apology for the horrible thing he did, then it does make the story a little bit better. <laughs> yeah. So we yeah. could just 
think that. But actually, our next episode will be (laughs) Sleeping Beauty in the Wood, and it will be a little bit better a clean it up a little bit more optimistic yes there it's we go. not as cleaned up or sterilized as what we know today like the disney mm-hmm. sleeping beauty mm-hmm. but it is better than this one okay can't okay. wait so if you enjoyed today's show please like and subscribe I agree. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for joining me, Andrea. It has been a pleasure, and I'm looking forward to the next story and the one after that and the one after that. Let's get to 100, and then we'll see where we'll go from there. That sounds good. Thank you again for listening. Check out our website at talesofbedlam.com for more fairy tale fun, and have a good night. Good night.